You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. I'm Jared Mounts. And we have a special guest. Uh, his name is Cat Daddy Charters or Gene Muma. Um, I am really trying to be able to make sure that I'm a platform to have conversation. I don't want to say that I'm one side or the other. I want to make sure I give everyone a chance to kind of speak their own mind. And I know with talking to the DWR in recently in several episodes, river keepers from the James River to the Shenandoah, you know, we've heard about the flathead issue. We've heard about the blue cat issue and we know what bass fishermen think. Mm -hmm. And I was blessed in the fall after we had the, the, the Mulliken episode about the Maryland DWR talking about the flathead issue. Um, I asked if a flathead fisherman would come on, I'm going to respect you. I just want to get your opinions why you like this. And I had a guy reach out to me. He's like, I would love to come on the show. And then luckily I, I got Gene to come on the show and he's going to talk to us f as a blue cat guide, as a cat fishing guide in general, just about cat fishing and why so many people like it. Because I think in, in a bass angler sense, like trout fishermen and fly fishing kind of thing, we get in a vacuum. Like, well, clearly if you don't bass fish, there's nothing else on the planet, but there's a lot of people that actually catfish mm -hmm. and enjoy it. And mm -hmm. so why do you enjoy it? You know, talk yeah, to us about you've it. You've always talked about it uh, <clears throat> being tribal and you're so right. And, uh, and it doesn't, we all have different interests and different likes and <clears throat> dislikes and it's, and we've all got to be able to uh, play in the same sandbox, if you will. Um, and like you said, I like how you say that you have conversations about it and, uh, you know, just work for the common good. Um, so yeah, that's good. Because if you don't, if you don't have these conversations, you know, if we don't bridge the gap and be able to talk about things in a, in a, in a semi nice way, mm -hmm. you know, it's just going to get more polarized. Mm -hmm. And you see this with politics, and it's kind of with fishing. Mm -hmm. And I think social media doesn't help it. And the doc talk is insane, mm -hmm. absolutely insane. And so example is, um, you know, I was talking about snakehead with Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, he was here yesterday with his kayak club, and bow fishing came up mm -hmm. again. And I've heard this so much. And in comment sections, like bow fishermen are going out there, and they're literally they'll shoot your dog, they'll shoot anything, they'll shoot any fish that's available. And just like with the snakehead stuff, I don't think all of it's true. And until we actually bridge the gap and talk to everyone about it, we won't be able to to discern fact and fiction. That, that's so important too. There's like you exactly right. There, what is true, and that's what we're trying to seek, you know as well and uh and is it there's a lot of misconceptions out there um and yeah when you know you heard odenkirk talk about it when the snakehead came on the scene that was, was going to somehow uh devastate the ecosystem and when he first made contact with you know two folks overseas and and kind of like what 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 are our problems we're going they're going to rise and they kind of question problems we don't we don't see problems with this species and we didn't know that you know they have mm. they're a toothy critter they're very aggressive and you think you know it's gonna be a problem well Come to find out, they're able to coexist in the same habitat, and uh, it works. And so, uh, I think to your point, your platform is good to have those civil conversations and, and get the right information out. Same thing happened with the the professional, the DNRs, and the the biologists and things like that. I, I heard a lot of negative here in the shop, and it's like until you really hear from the horse's mouth and hear them speak. And then again, like we always said before, understand they're outdoor. We're all outdoorsmen first mm -hmm. and foremost. Uh, we might be chasing different prey, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're still outdoorsmen. And so we've got to respect that, you know, respect that, um, that we're all in the same space. And so I, again, hats off to your platform, you know, for having these conversations in, in the right way. So, well, and, and thank, and thank you guys for, for everything and letting me basically have the freedom to just be mm -hmm. a, Try to be a news organization mm -hmm. almost. Right. Like I've had conversations before. It's like you got to pick the people that back you because I want to be able to hit hard mm -hmm. issues and not fear like, well, you can't talk about, mm -hmm. you know, wake boaters because we get paid mm -hmm. by them or something. Mm -hmm. And I can go out there and let's just let's have those conversations because they're yeah. needed. And it's on so many levels. I mean, the other thing I just thought about, too, is your tournament guys versus your weekend warrior mm -hmm. versus, you know, it's just. And there is, there's a lot of, you know, guys get really heated about some of this stuff. And if, if you're looking to mirror, you know, or is your organization really uh, um, doing good things for the fishery and not saying they're doing bad things. It's just, you know, when tournament versus, but like, and you listen to Odenkirk, Odenkirk didn't, doesn't have a problem with tournaments. You know, a lot of people talk negatively about tournament guys, but um the biologist says it's, it's, it, it is what it is, you know, there's yeah. going to be natural mortality and, 
you know. So anyway, it is. It's very, very interesting when you look at it from different perspectives. Hundred yep. percent. Gene, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. So, fun fact: he was actually our neighbor for how long? A couple years. And you've known my wife how long? Ten wow. years. And that's something. Yeah. So, um, and that was that, that's how honestly when I when I had to move to Hagerstown, it was he was our we we uh her parents own a duplex and then he was on one side of the duplex when we moved in the other side and so we got to talk ad nauseum about him you know starting a guide service and just fishing it in general That's cool. and so i think this is so interesting how come full circle here we are yeah, before it started what what got you into this like cat fishing and just fishing in general the fight the fight of the fish i was a big fat big bass fisherman went down the lower potomac for a weekend with a guy I'm fishing a tournament and I'm like, wow, this is really fishing. So next day I sold my boat and went and bought a catfish boat. Is that right? What was your boat beforehand? Just a tracker. Oh, just, oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Is that the boat that you still have to this day? Same boat? No. Now I have a 2022 Hughescraft. How big, runner. how big is it? 24 foot. 24 foot. Dang, dude, that's awesome. What specifically about the catfish do you feel like everyone else is missing? The blue catfish are, they eat dead items, dead fish, dead whatever, where everyone thinks that they're eating everything alive, but they're only eating the dead stuff that's floating around on the bottom. And without them, I mean, what's the river going to turn into if we don't have nothing that are eating trash? Mm -hmm. Hmm. But as far as, I mean, they're muscular. They put up a real good fight. And this is a great sport fish. Where did you start catching them when you first got going? Was it from the Tidal Potomac? Was it from the Upper Potomac? Tidal Potomac. Tidal Potomac. South of D.C. Oh, okay, cool. Wow. Because I know you also used to fish up at uh, Dam 5 and Dam 4, correct? But that yes. was different. Yeah, that's channel cats and, and uh, flatheads. And flatheads. When did you start thinking about that you actually wanted to become a guide? Like, how did that click? I enjoy putting people's people uh, smiles on people's faces and just to join them when they catch a big fish mm -hmm. and then from there it was like okay this is something i actually want to do eventually yep something i made my mind up and like i'm going to do it and so i went and got my license took my classes and got coast guard approved and how's that process <laughs> long <laughs> and not cheap it's so funny um by the time this episode drops, I the Chris Gorsuch episode and, and the Mike episode on the Susquehanna dropped. And the one thing that we came back to is like to be a guide, you have to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. You have to have the enjoyment of teaching and being able to see the smiles on someone else's faces mm -hmm. when they have success. Because not mm -hmm. everyone's cut out to be a guide at all. I mean, and, and that's what I think is so fascinating is when people think guide, you think like, oh, they're up at the front of the boat trying to make all the, they're trying to catch and stuff like, no, mm -hmm. they they want to see you be happy and be successful because that brings them joy. And I, I think that's something that, that you don't get enough credit on is why are you here? Why are you spending your time? Yeah, you're getting paid for it, but it's because your biggest victory is seeing them catch a fish of a lifetime or has, having a big smile. And, I, and I've looked at your Facebook before we started here and like w there was one photo, I'll see if I can find out about like this little girl holding a big catfish brimming ear to ear. And like, that's just gotta be awesome to mm -hmm. feel that. It is, it's, it's, it's a great feeling. And honestly, it has nothing to do with the money. It's just, the enjoyment out of it now why is your where does your guide service usually take place is it on the tidal potomac or do yes. you guys go multiple places like just talk a little bit about that um i put in most of the time at poheek bay down in lorton virginia which is on the tidal potomac that's normally where i meet my clients at and then normally we'll head i'll catch fresh bait in the morning sometime i'll let my clients help me if they something that they enjoy doing it's different i use a gill net to catch fresh shad and I have a license for that too. What's a gill nut? It's a net that's six foot wide, a hundred foot long. So is that, and I'm an idiot, everyone. Is that the one you throw? No, this here you just put up behind the boat. Okay, gotcha. And that's different from, is that the same type of netting that you see on the Potomac or is that different? That's different. What's that netting called? Or Well, the, that might be the, the um, for the commercial fishermen. Yeah. They just have like a... Um, it like lays on the bottom with a bunch of hooks on it, trout line. Oh, mm. okay, gotcha. That's what they use. Yeah, I just want to make sure people like there's discerning because I know we'll have a lot of bass guys listening that it's not your net they're seeing in the back of Matta Woman or, no. or, or any of that. It's no. different. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
that what the, what they're seeing is catching everything, which they have no control of what's going to bite that bait on that hook. Oh. Where I'm only targeting smaller fish that will get stuck in my net. The bigger carp, bass, that type of stuff won't get into my net mm. because they're bigger. Like I just use a small three inch nylon hole. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So whatever gets stuck in there can come out. I mean, you see, and then this is good for me because I'm an idiot on this subject matter. And I thought all the nets I've always seen at Matta Woman were nets like you guys put down to catch catfish bait. And, no. and that's what it was. And so I just learned something here that, that that's not you guys doing that. No, no. We put our nets out 10 to 15 minutes. We pull them back up. Ours don't stay in the water mm-hmm. like the trout lines do. Okay. Trout lines stay in the water day, two or three, four days. Oh, wow. Yeah. Are you seeing a lot of catfish guides in, in this area? How many would you say are in that same area space? In that same area down there that I know of that are just catfish, mm-hmm. to my knowledge, I'm the only one. Gotcha. That I know of. I know right. there's more down there that does catfish certain times a year, mm-hmm. and then they go back to striper fishing. Because that's where all the money is. Got it. Striper fishing? Stripers, yeah. 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 Why is that? It's considered a game fish, and just people think it's big whoopies to catch a 40-pound striper. That is interesting because I've, I've I've always been curious. Is a blue cat just a trash fish in this? Is the mindset of people that a catfish is trash because of where we're at? Because I'm assuming if you're in the Mississippi, if you're down in the Carolinas, not everyone has the same opinion on catfish as it feels like the Potomac and the James people do. Yes, that's correct. Where do you think that comes from? The government. The people, the charters at fishing, striper fishing, they think it's just based on just charters, just on the stripers and no other fish in the water. Mm. But a uh, catfish will give you twice the amount of a fight mm-hmm. as a striper will. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. Because 90% of the time when you're striper fishing, you're trolling. So as you're moving at four mile per hour, you're winding that fish in, you know, you're moving four plus you got the fish. Where if you're catfishing for blue catch, you're 40, 50 foot deep, 10, 12 ounce sinker, and a 50 pound catfish on the other end, it's twice as much fight as a striper. And how long does that fight usually last for your clients? Sometimes 10, 15, 20 minutes. Right. It all depends on that fish. And that is interesting. Like, I'm, because you know, people do target. Of course, I know for us around here, you know, catfishing was kind of like a nighttime activity. Mm-hmm. You know, you go out at night on the river, you know, and throw some chicken livers and such mm-hmm. and whatever and drag it on the bottom. Um, of course, again, bass fishing, like you said, you'll get them attacking whatever. Uh, but I think it is, I think you're right about the fight because you're not really those big cats you're not eating. But with the striper, I can see where people too, you get the fight, but you could also have some flays to take home and, you know, eat or throw in the freezer. So, you know, when you think about the mindset of a customer or how, you know, they're booking trips with you, like you said, to go catch, you know, one of the biggest fish out there with the best fight. Um, kind of like almost, I guess it'd be like a deep sea type thing, but only, you know, inshore, uh, type deal. So that is interesting. When did catfishing get, get really popular around here? Or when did it become what it is? And then guys, you know, I'm sharing on the screen right now, this absolute tank. Um, and then how big did you say this fish was roughly? Give I think that one was 62. I mean, that thing is, that's, I, that guy's smile says it all. That, that would be fun to catch whether, you know, you like catfish or not. That would definitely put a bend in your rod. Mm. When, when did the Potomac river become this size caliber of fish? I'd say 30 years ago, about 30 years ago. Wow. Hmm. That's insane. Really? 30 years ago? And the commercial fishermen are really killing it. Really? When did that start? Um, they've been down there all, as far as I know, all the time I've been fishing down there. But I say in the last five years, it's got really bad. So can is it hard to catch that caliber of fish now? Is that more of a It's rarity? getting harder. It's getting harder? Yes. They saw the same thing with striper, from what I understand. Last time we went on a striper trip, uh, Eastern Shore, I think we had one you know, the whole time. And it's, and that's what he said. He said, it's becoming harder and harder to catch fish. And, you know, and I don't know if, I mean, I think he kind of said the same thing, the commercial, you know, industry. And I mean, who knows? I don't know enough about it to, uh, but it's definitely, it'll hurt the industry. It'll hurt your livelihood if you're not able to 
get to get those catch rates, you know, with for your clients. It, it's just interesting to me because it's like when Gene says, like, it's been 30 years and it feels like just in the last two years. And again, it could just be because now I'm doing this podcast and I'm so in it now that it feels like people are now just complaining more about the blue cats than mm -hmm. before. Again, guys, it could be wrong. It could have always been there. And I, I'm just tuning into it. But it's like, why now is it an issue? If, if they've been there 30 years, is it mm -hmm. just like people are more aware of it now? It's just hit a critical mass because... On the one hand, you know, you have bass guys saying like they're everywhere. There's billions of them and they're eating everything. And then, you know, you have catfish guys that come and like, well, now we're not catching the big ones anymore. They're kind mm -hmm. of going away. So you can't have it. Can you have it both ways? Can you say like there's too many of them and then there's not enough? Like, what's the deal with that? You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't it's, know. It's interesting. That's, that is. And I was, I brought it up earlier when we were talking about this subject, but and I don't know. I know like, for example, smallmouth, they're not laying as many eggs as the largemouth. And so I don't know if, if populations, at least on the rivers are such that they're, um, laying more eggs. Cause you do see now again, different river. I'm, um, I'm speaking more of the Shenandoah river, but, um, so yeah, I don't know. It's an, an interesting, cause it I, sound doesn't sound like there's a lot of fishing pressure as far as guys other than like you said commercial 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 or killing it but are they using those big cats too though are they because i hear they're not as good to eat but they're not they're meat yellow all, they're mushier but they're really? probably using for dog food and different things they're too. selling them to places down in dc and virginia okay restaurants mm. interesting shipping them out and they're still giving out more permits hmm. huh. to help get rid of the blue of the, the blue cats because of probably the invasive species label and things like that. Because I know that there's invasive species tournaments, things like that, to catch, kill, and to try to get them out of there. Yeah. Um, which which is absolutely wild. Because I believe, I, pulling it from my memory banks, there was a a, a piece in the, the Times five or six years ago talking about being able to possibly catch a 100-pound blue cat out of the Potomac. And the Potomac was like the up-and-coming, will it beat the James River in size? Um, and maybe you could speak to more of that. When, when was the golden era for the Potomac for blue cats? Is that is that now or is that in the past? I'd say five, six years ago. Okay. It was, it was better. But as long as we keep on allowing more and more commercial fishermen, and they're keeping everything. And as long as they continue letting them grow and grow and grow, the population of the bigger ones is going to go down, down, down. Where are you seeing a lot of this commercial fishing? Um, south of the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Okay. So below, I guess that's below Reagan Airport, correct? Yes. Okay. D.C. does not allow it. Oh, I didn't know that. D.C. is our own little world up there. Is that why there's so many people fishing for catfish in D.C.? Is there a bigger population of them? No, there's not a bigger population. Just it, it's a channel up there on the left-hand side. Oh. And the right-hand side's real shallow, so the fish have less area to run in. Gotcha. And it's a no-wake zone. All of these, pretty much all of D.C. waters is a no-wake zone. So you can fish comfortably without bouncing around in the water. Or if you go down there where it's no-wake zone, you got boats coming 10 feet by you at 50 miles per hour. So it's almost like a little lake. Almost yeah. up there. That yeah. makes a lot of sense, actually. Hmm. Yep. I didn't even think about that. How many rigs are you throwing? How many, when you, uh, what does a typical line look like when you're throwing out? Um, and what are you using? I know you talked about shad earlier. You're catching shad. Yeah, 99% right? of the time I use fresh shad mm -hmm. that we catch down there. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, I'll throw in an eel or two mm -hmm. just for shits and giggles. But you use like a bottom rig? or Yes, bottom rig. I use a 12-ounce circle hook. 50 pound slime line. And if you want, let's go right into it. Did you want to go grab some rods? We kind of get into the tackle rigging and stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. That's a good transition. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, that's fascinating to me about the. And that's something else I want to kind of get on the show too is talking about the commercial fishing because that's another through line everyone talks about mm -hmm. is that. And it's yeah. like, how do we tackle that issue? How do we mm -hmm. talk about that? Yeah. No, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different spaces. I mean, there's a lot of different. Especially when you're dealing with the tidal water thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like uh, Lake Anna, because you're not going to have commercial fishing right, in Lake Anna. Right, But the James and, and Potomac, you do, and that's just another factor. And I feel like the less transparency you have as an organization, the more rumors spread. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and again, it's like, I remember that comment section when Mulliken was like, you know, people were saying like, well, you know, Maryland is actually stocking flathead in the river. And Mulliken's like, no, we're not. <laughs> right. We're not doing that. Right. And it's like, so it's like... 
So is it because you don't have transparent, you, you don't communicate this, the rumors start or vice versa? So it's right. like, what's going on with the commercial fishing? Should we have somebody on to talk about that? Like, okay, I want to hear your side of the story. Correct. Because I was ignorant. And I literally thought those were just nets that were out there on the water. Ooh. And those were catfishing nets. Well, I would imagine too. And I don't know. So it's probably wrong for me <laughs> to say, but I can imagine it's like everything else. If you've got, if the money's in the commercial yes. and the investors are in the commercial industry and there there's more money in that they're going to in like when you think about legislation and what they're allowed to do i mean they're the ones in the court system and we're hearing a lot from like like your river keepers talking about that's what's so good about what they're doing is they're they're anning up and and putting lawyers in the court system to mm -hmm. go when it talks about water quality so but like on the same token here if they have the money and the means to be able to go in and change legislation or like he says permitting and allowing allowing you to go in and and because they look at his dollars you know and so in that industry and then they don't they there's not enough pool for the the small man the small business um or the the recreational angler mm -hmm. you know so you're not we're not going we're not the ones down there we're not the squeaky wheel if you will um which i'm realizing too the market he's in is not really i don't think the controversy comes to that so much in the waters he's on as it is your Susquehanna River, Shenandoah River, your smaller rivers with the smallmouth. But um, you talked about what's the name of your line again? Slime line. And that's my question. I heard this the other day and I had to chuckle because I agree. How in the world does a catfish get slime all the way up your line? Like yes, they they twist a, and roll, I twist. guess, and they get because you get that out there. The next thing you know, you got slime everywhere. My cousin is famous for catching these cats, you know, all the time. It's like, get the net. We think we got a big and it stays down. And like you say, you can feel it rolling. But uh, anyway, that's always. No, uh, that, that is fascinating. Cause like, I mean, while we get into the tackle, how does a catfish hunt? And I know it's different between species, but let's, we'll start with blue. Cause we're talking about blue. How does a blue cat hunt in general? Is it only just like a carp just sucking on the bottom? Because I've, how many times raise your hand if you caught one on a chatterbait? Like, <laughs> like I have, so rattle it's trap. like a rattle trap. Or yeah. Spinner bait even. Or, so yeah. it's like, wait a minute. I thought these things just ate on the bottom. So like, I'm, it, are they just a predator? They are to a certain extent, but in, in my life of catching and fishing, targeting catfish, I'd say 99% of it targets the dead bait before it does a live bait. Mm. And that's for all catfish or blues? That's blues. Just blues? Okay. Channel cat will take both, hmm. but they prefer like chicken liver and shrimp and that type of stuff. And the flatheads prefer live bait, like bluegill, anything alive. I know people even fish for them with small um, baby catfish. I know mm. down... Um um, when we talked about the flathead episode, they even said like in Alabama and place like that, they'll use bass as bait yeah. where it's, where it's legal allegedly. Um, so that, yeah, that's fascinating to me. Like they are a little bit separate, uh, but yeah, let's just, let's get into it right now. Go for it. Like wh right. where do we start? All right. I'll use a 50 pound mono slime line. It's great line, tough, good abrasive nighttime with a black light or blue light. It glows really, really well. And if you guys get on my Facebook page, Cat Daddy Fishing Charters, you'll see pictures on there of the line at nighttime. It's great. Then I use a 60 pound leader line, just mono. I try to stick with a 10 or 12 ounce Gatsumishi circle hooks. That's what I prefer. And then I also have the Mad Cat hooks that I like. They're pretty similar to the same. And I guess you can see them. Yeah. And it, wh why, um, why a circle hook? Well, on the lower Potomac, it's the law that you have to use a circle hook if you're using really? any type of bait or anything because of the stripers. Again, this is why I love this damn show. I did not know that was a rule. I would be gone to prison for that. Yep. I wow. Okay. So I use. Who came up with that idiotic rule? I could use a four graph treble hook on a crankbait, but I need a circle hook if I use dead bait. It's dead like bait what if the striper bait. eats? Okay, that's. <laughs> they think it's catch and release easier because circle hook. Ninety five percent of the time, you catch it right in the corner of the mouth. Mm hmm. And they don't swallow it to where you can safely release a striper. Uh, okay. So all this is based on striper fishing. 
So is that like, do you think that rule came in with a commercial mindset? Like, do they have to use circle hooks too? Yeah, they do. They're supposed to. Okay, gotcha. I know they don't, but they're supposed to. Mm. They use a straight shaft hook. We'll go. We'll come back to that later. We'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, most of the time it's just because you can safely release the fish that you catch. And in my 20 years, I might have had one catfish that actually swallowed the whole hook. Wow. But 90% of the time with a circle hook, you let the fish hook itself. You don't set the hook. So you're keeping that in the rod holster and then you're just waiting for it to double down yep. and then get it. When into it doubles it. down, you just pick it up, start winding. Okay. And then it automatically will set itself. And then I apologize. What size uh, line are you using? I, I probably missed this that. This is a 50 mono. 50 mono. Okay. And then I'll use a 60 liter. Gotcha. And then guys, uh, again, you know, up on top, you can see uh, from, again, link in the episode description, of course, to everything we talked about today. But you can see with that black light, what that line does. And there's a couple of TikTokers that do this too, where they bank fish and they just light up everything. And I think that is such a, a brilliant idea just to be able to like line detect. That's such a cool thing. Just aesthetically, it just looks neat. So my apologies. In real life, it's even better. Really? The pitcher do, do, does it no justice. That is so cool. Especially with these mad cat rides at nighttime fishing, you can't beat them. What is it? What are you specifically looking for in a good catfish rod? Good backbone, soft, okay. flimsy tip, and good backbone in general. And what did you say your fluoro was again? My what, what size fluoro? This is mono. Or mono my leader is mono. 60. 60. Why, why mono versus fluorocarbon? Just something I always used. Okay. And it always works, so I just stick to it. Why I'm, fix it if it ain't broke? Yeah, and that's what I was thinking earlier. I mean, hats off to mono. You know, what we we're talking, everybody, mm. that's the line debate everybody talks about. And granted, it's 50 and 60, but it's still, I mean, you're talking about a 60 pound, 70, 80 pound cat. So, like, uh, its stuff is strong. Plus, the, the shock absorption. Because yes. mono, I know, like, when you shark fish, a lot of times you use mono because it has mm. a stretch and the abrasion resistance. Correct. Yeah. And I think we, I think, was it, I think you mentioned like slime and they mm -hmm. roll. Yeah. Having that stretch and abrasion resistance yes. is probably a good thing it's to probably have. Probably a good thing. And, that, and I, that goes to all these guys out here that, and again, it's debated and everybody's personal preference, you know, braid a, you know, leader or straight braid or this oh, or we're that. And it's that. like, yeah. we're just, and we're talking about a smaller fish that we're, you know, small mouth and large mouth, but that's another case in point mm -hmm. um, that it works. So don't, don't overthink it. But anyway, yeah, keep going. That's good. And I, with you talking about braid, another issue with, with the braid, when you put braid on these type of reels, you can't get it real, real tight. So, so whenever you get a 30, 40, 50 pound cat, right. it, it's got so much force behind it that okay. whenever your braid will get tight yes. around your line, yes, and then it'll eventually crisscross and everything yes. else. So when you go to cast it back out, you'll get skips yes. to where it's overlapping and stuff. And this so is good too for people that are mm -hmm. that are going out, or you always get that. You know, what what line do I use? What should I use? And you know, not doing it. So this is all. This is good information. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. I've been using Slime Line now for quite a few years. It's stuff. Me, I used to use Power Pro, to I realize of the how it's doing with the reels and stuff like that. There, and I just go to this here now. And you mentioned the reels. Uh, what what's what's special about these reels? Um, they have a drag system or a clicker system, right? Yeah, they got clickers, drags, free spool. I use pin, pin war fields, um, akumas. That's probably my best go-to reels. How important is the clicker system? You know, I, we've had people on the show before that would like, he would use his flathead reels, not only for catfishing, but also when he would go shark fishing at the beach. And he said, like, you need a clicker system. Is that something that that is pretty important to have if you're shopping for a reel? No, it's not necessary. If you um, watch your reels, you don't need it. But if you're going to do other stuff while your reels are at back in the back of the boat or whatever, that click of noise will give you a hint that one's biting on it or one's taking it. At nighttime, I will turn them on occasionally. But they also get annoying. They're just constantly clicking all the time. But even when you wand them in, they click. Gotcha. So you don't need it, but if you could, if you if you could get a free one, then it's not a bad oh, thing yeah, to have no. either. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then why bait casters uh, versus spin tackle, or is this more of like this is best thing for a boat setup versus bank fishing? Well, I have some open faces that I use, but okay. these just seem like they're better and stronger for the bigger cats, and I feel more secure with them than I do an open face. 
Okay, that makes sense. Hmm. An yes. open face to get a fifty pound mono, you're not gonna be able to get a whole lot of mono on them. And some holes I fish is a hundred foot deep. Wow. Wow. The river's that deep? Yes. I didn't know the Potomac was That's that deep. That's crazy. Mm. Damn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of holes up in DC water south is over a hundred foot deep. And catfish Man. will live that deep. Yep. That's crazy. Incredible. Summertime. Any, any special uh knot from your line to hook? I don't use anything special. I learned when I was a kid on the back of an eagle claw mm-hmm. package, and that's the way I learned, and that's the way I've always yeah. done it. And, there you go. It works. And it's very, very tough line. Tough, tough mm-hmm. knot. Mm-hmm. I use um a floating bobber about four inches below my hook. If I throw out eight rods, I might have four with bobbers and four without bobbers. A lot of times in the summertime, you get the grass growing in the bottoms. This will bring the bait above the grass. So that the, the fish can still find the bait. Where are you? So with the setup, where are you putting that? Are you putting, so it's, you have your swivel, right? You have your main line, your swivel, and then you have, uh, oh, wow. I didn't know it was that close. Like right there. Oh, damn. That doesn't freak him out? Nope. Huh. It makes that float bait off, that bait float off the bottom. I didn't know that. As you can see, it must set up setup here. Mm-hmm. It's about four or five inches from the hook. And I use a sliding egg sinker. And where does that egg sinker stop? Or is it, can, it, can it go all the way to the hook? Or is it... Where, how, it goes to the leader? leader. Right to here. How long is your leader, generally speaking? This one's probably about two and a half foot. That's way off the bottom. That's insane. Like, it just... Again, growing up, you you took your chicken liver and it had to be on the bottom because listen catfish only eat stuff that's on the bottom and now you're hot air ballooning this damn thing off the bottom and that's just i okay didn't know that that yep. is so neat i guess it's similar to the trout like the sea trout and stuff where they do the what is that called with the they've got floats as well and it's kind of the same concept with shrimp i think mm-hmm. um yeah it's interesting I didn't know that. <laughs> but I fish some with floats and some without floats. Okay. Well, and I'll use different size baits too. What's the pro and con? Like in your mind, why are you going with float and without float? What Most of for? it is because of the debris in the water, grass in the water. Mm-hmm. And from day to day, they change on what they like. I mean, I have had, and again, I'm, we're not, I'm not speaking to Blue Cap, but I've had them come up and hit, you know, top water. Yes. Um, so to your point, and I guess that's what we got to think about too, is they're, they're a living, you know, living creature that has to eat. And so they're also opportunistic. Um, and so you're right, Thomas, that's the way we were like fishing off the bottom, but, but you quickly learn in bass fishing that mm-hmm. they're going to eat in the entire water column. And, 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 but since just like bass, they're not always going to take stuff off the top, but we had to fish all levels of the water column. But, um, that is interesting. If we, that's not working, let's say you're not catching on that, do you switch up your, your technique or yep. rigs? What yep. would you go to after that? Well, normally if I put out eight rides, I'll do like four and four. Four mm-hmm. on the bottom, four floats. Okay, okay. So normally Covering one of them the two will will work. Covering the whole spectrum. Yeah. And, and this will be good. Um, And then guys, and so I'll make sure this, this picture is up. It is. Okay, perfect. So looking at this picture here, and we'll just go with the four rods up. That's, fu- that's fine for this. I'm looking at this, I just see four rods, but I'm assuming this. there's a plan here with each rod setup, correct? Yes. What's going on with, just just walk us through why you have this rod setup, because I've always seen this on YouTube with these rod setups, but I never understood why. Like I like on that boat there, that's my older boat. I had uh, eight rods, two on each side and four out the back. And I threw two out far, then two closer. I stage them based on my weight of my, of my sinker. Oh. So these two rods right here, dead back, are they are they further out or closer? One of each. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. And then these are one of each as well? Yes. And then they're out at an angle? Yes. So hmm. you're able to basically cover a massive area. With Correct. That. Yep. That is an interesting strategy. Now, up where I'm fishing at there is up in D.C., up close to the um, chain bridge. So your channel is not very wide up there. Mm. words deep so you're trying to hit you could almost hit like both channel edges and then dead in the center yep i there's such a science to this i didn't know there was such a science to this and i'll even drop some right down straight from the boat 
Really? Because we're talking 40, 56 foot is feet it, deep. Is it really that deep there? That's insane to me. Like, I never even knew that. Of course, I'm a bass guy. I would not but be. <laughs> don't go by the it. charts because I can tell you the charts ain't ain't true. Really? Yes. So I have a quick question too on that. Um, and I just thought about this, you know, I'm a captain for the youth a lot of times. And uh, we just recently had a qualifier on the chick. And, you know, coming back, you always see, regardless of the river you're on, Potomac, Chick, some of your big rivers, James, you're going to come across the cat fishermen that are anchored up and, and have their lines out. So from your perspective, and it's fun, it's interesting, because I was talking about this with the kayak guys yesterday, and Mike and I were having a conversation of making sure, back to what we were saying, is like um, whether we're launching a boat for the kayakers, launching, making sure you put your kayaks off the side so the boats can launch, and just on the water, respect for each other, mutual respect. I'm glad you brought so this my, up. My question is, and I don't think about it sometimes, I'm guilty of sometimes – you know, we're getting to the next spot or whatever, and I'll see you, but, and I'll see the lines out. So I try to always, I try to be respectful and get out wide, but what are some things that we need to be considered of when you guys are out there catfishing? Like how far out are your lines and what are some things that you see that, that we can improve on and say as bass anglers or other kayakers or whatever, they're using um, that same water space. Usually you're all out in the main channel, like you say, but. Or close. Yeah. Or close. Um, Is there anything that comes to mind? I know a couple, I fish at a couple pillars mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll get bass fishermen will try to squeeze between me and the pillar. Right, right, right. Which a couple of years ago, I'm actually on, it was, um, the Walmart fishing one. What's that one called? The Walmart has that tournament. FLW? Yeah. Babe was down there. Okay. And a bass guy came down towards Quantico. Mm-hmm. And he stopped and asked me if he could squeeze between me and the wall. Awesome. The fact that he asked. Yeah. I think yeah. Is and good, I'm like, right? yeah. I'm like, sure, no problem. Because my bait's at the bottom. Cool. And he's up on top. And that's, to me, that's the way it should be. Yes. I, I agree. mean, the fact that he asked, yeah. you granted permission, and then you guys work together in that space yeah. as opposed to just coming right in and squeezing in on you. And then while he was there, a whole bunch of boats surrounded us. And come to find out, he was in first place. Gotcha. So all the cameras were around. Year, what, what did he look like? Or what year was it? Yeah. Two, maybe three years ago. That's pretty cool. And he went up to DC. No, he was down Quantico area. Quantico. That tournament they was fishing out of was Fort Smallwood. Fort that's Small. where they have all the big tournaments at. <sighs> that's pretty cool. I just think, yeah, okay, like, wow, that's pretty cool. And that's that really cool. Power plant is right across from Quantico, right across from Fort Smallwood. Gotcha. But he was in first place. We had yeah. no idea. Yeah, yeah. So sure. then he started talking about him and his business. Okay. Then I started talking about me. Isn't that neat? While we was on video. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So he was actually pretty cool. No, and that's, and gosh, that's, and even for bass anglers, I, I try, and again, I don't, I'm not always great about it, but I try to be conscious of that. And whether it is, you know, you're both coming down the same bank or whatever, you know, hey, go ahead, you know, or what, just the communication. I've seen kayakers, it may not always work out, but you're better off to have that conversation. Right. And, um, uh, respect each other's space and they te teach you a lot of that in your charter school and okay. stuff that who has the right away and stuff like that there mm -hmm. like if they're in a kayak and i'm actually got my motor going mm -hmm. i have the right away okay the kayakers should yes stay away yes do they always listen no. and right. I think this is an issue because i had this with chris gorsuch and we're actually we're going to be doing another conversation with him and mike about etiquette because i think yes. it's interesting Everybody I've had on the show has their own version of etiquette. Yes. And I'm, and I'm saying that, like, f based on that, I think the biggest issue on the water is everyone has their own version of what the rules yes. are. And and if you have to go get certified, you have your own set of rules. That's and right. so just because you think you're – you guys, we all need to operate with the same playbook. Correct. And I don't know how we do that. Well, I think what he said was cool, too, the fact that he went through his classes, he was educated about that. I mean, mm -hmm. prior to that, you may or may not have thought of it that way. You know, and we're looking at it. No, you're 100% right, Thomas. And I think it's education. I think it's conversations like you're having here. It's it's having that etiquette conversation. Because we got to teach the next generation, especially Correct. bass guys, about these high schools, Absolutely. about the proper etiquette. That's right. And, like, and how you act. And this is one thing that I've seen, too. And I really would like your opinion about this. I'll pull this picture up here. I know when I'm fishing the Potomac River, and depending on the creek, you're going to have a ton of guys bank fishing like this. Yes. And I, I want your opinion. How much of a berth, if I'm in a boat going into a creek, do I need to give guys when I see all these lines? Because part of me is like, of course, I don't want to get my prop messed up, but I also don't want to, you know, make that piss them off or destroy their gear. When you see lines like this out, 
how much of birth do you need to give them at least just so you don't destroy their stuff? I Depends mean, on where you're fishing. I mean, down there there's some holes 10 feet from the bank that's 60 foot deep. Hmm. You won't interrupt them. I but, see what he, yeah. Okay. But then you have, and me for one, I don't know how many times I've cussed people out in boats, me fishing on the bank. And bass fishermen, for mm-hmm. one, they would throw their lure right beside me in the water. Mm-hmm. Really? It used to irritate me so mm-hmm. bad. I want to pick rocks up and throw it at them when I was a kid. Now, th- this is good. Now, talk about that some more because I think this is like, I, I know I when I was younger, I struggled with this too. So, yeah. you mean they're on their trolling motor just fishing right past you? Yeah. I think if you got someone in the bank, stay away from them. Totally. That's their space. That's all the space they have. Yeah, you give have a boat, them, you can go anywhere. Give them 50, 75 to 100 foot at least. Mm-hmm. Okay, gotcha. So, let's say I am... And then again, guys, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see this. If I'm up near this tree and I'm working down the bank and I, and I, I turn the corner and I see these guys bank fishing, you're saying as soon as I see them a hundred yards towards them and then go around and then how much of a radius should I need to give them? You're saying like a hundred, I'd say a hundred feet plus. Mm -hmm. Okay. So hit that hundred for me to them and then go out an extra hundred and then I can continue down the bank. Okay. Gotcha. That little bit of an area you're, you're missing there. It's not going to kill you. Mm Mm-hmm. No, that, that's good. Because, yeah, again, like, I don't know how many times have you been on the Potomac with kids or, or, or yeah. by yourself fishing and you see bank guys. And yeah. I've always wondered just and it was always selfish because, like, mm. I just didn't want to get line cracked up mm. in my motor. Uh, and I didn't even think about them. Mm. But just from an etiquette standpoint of like when you see that line, how far out is it going mm. where it's just subsurface? Mm-hmm. So from that situation, give them 100, uh, at least 100. But then mm. also it's just proper etiquette for them because they can't mm. go anywhere. That's that, right. That's it. Yep, that's their space. Yeah. yeah. And you get some people that. Say the average person fishes, I'm, I'll use the lower Potomac, will use a two or three ounce weight, 60 foot deep, strong current. Their bait's going to eventually be right beside the bank mm-hmm. because they don't have enough weight to keep it there. That's say, why say we that use- again, how much ounces do you think they use? Three ounces? Some of them use two or three. And that still, wow. Some of them don't even use that. I didn't realize the current could be that strong. I'll start it's drop wicked. shotting with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's wicked down there. That's why I use eight to sixteen ounce sinkers. Good uh, God! No wonder you need such a heavy rod. That's insane. Huh? Yep. And I make my own. It's probably cheaper. Is that right? A lot uh, cheaper. A lot cheaper. How much would those cost if you bought them from a store? About three dollars, three fifty a piece. So you get guys complaining about losing them. Uh, <laughs> and some, a I tell you what, two trips ago. I probably lost a dozen mm. because of all the, the debris coming down from the storms that we had. Oh, I didn't make sense. That. Yep, that's crazy. And that you're right about the current. I mean that that that, that that's a strong river. I mean people, I don't think people respect it for what no, it is. Not down um, there, they don't. Which makes me think. I mean, I would jump around a little bit, but then the big thing on the Potomac too is weather. I mean, I guess you've got a radio on there too, or having to pay I close do. attention. Because that stuff could pop up and you go out, it's nice, you know, nice. And in no time at all, it could be, you know, craft advisory. That's why I bought a bigger boat. I don't have to worry about it. Right. I mean. Makes a difference, yeah. My boat's designed for the Great Lakes. Oh, wow. So it can handle anything the mm-hmm. Laura Bertoma can mm-hmm. put out. So let's get into bait because bait is going to be a, a really interesting topic. What are the, let's go with the best bait in the world you could possibly have that's actually legal first and then let's go with what anyone could probably get in a pinch that could still work possibly down there or anywhere Ooh, i like that let's go down yeah let's just do both shad probably number one bait for larger better quality fish um sunfish is also good anything that is in that water will be better for bait than if you bring something that might be at a lake or a pond Good point. that they're not used to. Interesting. They're used to eating what is in their tributary. Mm-hmm. But I'd say their number one bait is is shad. And I've used eel, but eel I've never caught nothing big on. Really? As I say big, I'm talking anything over 40 pounds. Yeah, that's actually, I don't think I asked this. What is big to you? And, and, and I think you answered that, is 40 plus. My goal is every trip to put a client on at least a 30 pounder. What's the, bigger. what's the worst day you've re- re- weight wise you've had for the biggest fish? Um, maybe twenty pounds, which is still the biggest fish yeah. I would have ever caught. What's gotten. the biggest? 
Seventy three point four. Wow, God, that is a, that's a big. One. That's a ten. He's actually on my Facebook page too. Okay, yeah, we'll fifteen year old too. from Mercersburg. Is that right? Really? Like he said he probably couldn't stop smiling. Um, he thought we were stuck in a log. <laughs> it was uh, early May. We was up in DC water, and we was catching eaters all day long, 10, 11 pounders, because that's what they wanted. Mm-hmm. They want to take some home to eat. Okay. Then all of a sudden. My rod just goes down like never before. Was it this year or last year? Last year. Last year. And um, I really thought it was a striper. Because most of the time, the catfish will just go straight down. Mm-hmm. This thing went out like a like a rocket. And just the reel was just a... Bzzz, and it gave me chills from one end to the other end. But after a couple minutes, I realized then it was a big old catfish. And I had to take it out of the rod holder because the boy just couldn't get out of the rod holder. It was putting so much pressure yeah. on the rod. Yeah. I got it. I got it off the rod holder and set the hook in it to make sure it was nice and hooked. And then he took over. Wow, man! And that you know, without that equipment, the hooks and the line and just how you're rigged up, how many guys? Of course, you're out in the main channel. Most guys aren't probably hooking up out there. But I just think about those bigger fish; they'll break the average angler off. You know, you never get to see what it is or know what it is, but you're able to bring them in. That's crazy. I have my drag set a little bit loose to most people, mm-hmm. and then I adjust it as need mm-hmm. to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said before, good quality stuff is a big, big oh, thing. Oh, it makes a big difference. I'm, I am trying to find this thing. It is... It's in my new boat. So this is, this is March of 21, 21. It was May of 22. So that means we have to go this way. And that's just some of them. A lot of bald eagles down there. Mm -hmm. That one's a tank. What hours do you usually run your guide service? Uh, Depends on the time of the year. Mm -hmm. Normally 6 a.m. in the morning till there it is. Yeah. Oh, oh my, my god. Look at that thing. I had to pull up on his shoulder. Holy. He couldn't even pick it up on his shoulder. That looks like a pot belly pig without legs. <laughs> yes. And what I did for him and his dad, I actually had um I said, that would be fun. Like I don't you know, you know what I mean? Like yeah, oh, it, when it, it get that him. big. It, it it wore that boy out like you wouldn't believe. So I had cool. him and his dad. I took that picture. And I had two t-shirts made, one for him and one for his dad, with his name on the top, the picture of the fish, and his name on the bottom, one for him and one, and one for his that dad. That is so cool. That's awesome. There's a couple more pictures of him on there, too, I think. Do, do they... F- I, again, bass fishing guy, not really targeting him. Maybe the biggest I've hooked is, I don't know, 12 pounds. And do they fight differently when they get that big? Because I think, oh, yeah. I think a big issue when it comes to understanding people's enjoyment of this is the fact that we're used to catching these smaller ones and and we think like okay all they do is they roll on the line and they're pain in the butt and they slam your line yucky but when you're dealing with a pot belly pig like that how do they fight what what is that kind of like as he called it he said he thought he was wanting in a shark really do they run at all or oh, they, yeah or they just they wallow no they they run Really? I imagine closer you get to the boat, too, they want to turn and go, too. Yes, once they see that boat. see, they're going to turn and get. Yep. And I'll tell people that, and I'll, he's like, it's coming in, it's coming in. And so wait till he sees that boat. Mm-hmm. And then he'll turn around and go. Mm-hmm. And it happens every time. That's fascinating, because it's always like, um, I think every fish has a different fighting style. Small mouth, you know, they're going to be aerobatic. Tarpon, they're aerobatic. Uh, snakehead and musky people have said like it's usually as soon as you set the hook that's the biggest run is it's just Mm -hmm. an explosion and then it kind of peters out so a catfish is kind of that bulldog where you're gonna have a run and then it's gonna feel like dead weight it gets closer to the boat and then you're gonna have another another run yep but when you're dealing with something that's close to 100 pounds (laughs) can you talk a little more to that fish as we're looking at like like the whiskers and the eye is very small like i I know smell is i think important to them but like just as that predator we're looking at, like wh- what role does a whiskers play? And there's, um, what are some, because I like what you were saying too about the bait and just kind of like match the hatch what's in the water. So, but that, that animal right there, that fish, what, what is, what is going on right here with the whiskers and the eyes and scent? Eyes, that? I don't know a whole, whole lot about. Um, they got a big mouth. Some of the blues have a bigger mouth than some of the other mm-hmm. blues. Mm-hmm. Um, whiskers or the, some of their scent. Mm-hmm. 
uh, other than that, I I don't know. I think they're probably feeling with those whiskers, from what I understand. They're they're yeah, I don't know either. That's but they're they're a heck of a predator. I mean, you can look at them and tell. It is, and it's just it's just fascinating to me. It's like this is where I think you need to to truly understand or appreciate the different again i'll call it cultures fishing cultures and catfishing is its own culture snake heads guys it's its own culture until you catch something like this and and joe talked about it to me like a big snake head is actually called a dragon is actually yeah. the, the the term for it and like that's like all right mm. that's already cool like yeah. the idea that you could say like what like a big buck has its own idea like mm. you know you get mm. a 10 pointer but if you hook a dragon that puts you in that thing mm -hmm. if you're in the catfish culture and you hook a freight train like this it, what come on how does that not put a smile on your face it's a hog is that what they call it like a hog <laughs> dude that's absolutely that's so cool that's so cool like i said he was so big i had to put him up on the boy's shoulder and it took all i had even to weigh him i had to stand up on my seat because i'm so short <laughs> and he and he was so big mm -hmm. hey have you has anyone ever caught a hundred pounder out of the river i'd say yes but the new maryland laws is that you have to kill it to turn it in for a state record. Really? really? And a true cat fisherman won't, won't kill it. Kill it. Huh. They'll release it. They're not worried about that state record. That's wild. It's always interesting because like, I've always had this this thought process of cat fishermen before I started this podcast of you know, they basically keep everything. Mm. And then you realize they're no different than musky anglers or yep. trout anglers yep. or bass guys where they're going to conserve yep. this thing. And the true giants, they're going to put back. That That is absolutely fascinating. A true fisher, cat fisherman will put them back. Wow. Someone that's dedicated to cat fishing. <laughs> mm -hmm. How many people actually catfish in this area? Give or take. Like, you don't have to like, is it a lot? Is it a little? More, more than you think. I've actually booked a trip on the way down here. Really? A guy called me. He wants to go out April 30th. That's so crazy. I mean, w would you, is there any advice or uh, could we talk about like bank fishing for catfish? Is there anything like that? Any tips you can give people or kids? Heavyweight, use the bait that's in the water. What's, what's in the tributaries. Um, find it, find some depots. And then could we um, do a, a map breakdown of just generically what you're looking for? And it doesn't have to be like your good stuff. We can just pick a random place on the chart because I'm actually fascinated well, by this. Well, everyone knows a follower of me on Facebook that the Woodrow Wilson is my number one go-to hole. Did you want to talk about that or something more random? No, that's fine. Okay. Oh my God, sorry. That's I get I people saying. messaging me all the time and thank me on Facebook for I, following me and finding my, my holes. I think this is Woodrow Wilson. No, you got to go farther south. Oh, farther south? Okay. That's D.C. Oh, down here? Yeah. Yep. Right there. At the National Harbor. Okay. I think that's good. I think everyone everyone can see this. So, okay. What, what are we dealing with here? The two main over in the channel to the left. Right here. The dark zone. Yes. That's the pillars. Okay. And that's in the middle there is the main channel where you're supposed to use, which is a no wake zone. From there on up, pretty much the whole way up to Haynes Point is a no wake zone. Um. I like fishing the right-hand side of the second pier. For some reason, it's all the same depth right through there, hmm. but seem like the fish hang out better on the right-hand side. How I understand with smallmouth, like example, in, in in rivers, current breaks, and how smallmouth set up. What do you catfish? How do you catfish set up? What is their behavior? Because I always just hear deep hole, throw it on the bottom. Is there more to it than that? Do oh, they, most certainly. Yeah. How do they like to set up with current? Well, that's tidal water. So when the tide comes in, I always fish the lower side of the bridge. Okay, the downstream side. Got yes. It. When the tide goes out, I fish the upper side of the bridge. Why? Because that's the way the back of the boat will go with the channel and the bait. Oh. So when the channel when the tide comes in, it's pushing bait, dead things up against those. Um, pillars. Okay. So that's where I throw my bait at. Gotcha. And when the tide goes out, I do. I just switch to the opposite side and set up the same way. Gotcha. Now, are they are they relating to the deep water or just the pylons or both? I think it's the current there and the pylons and everything pushing up against it. So it's a giant eddy, basically. Mm -hmm. And you're fishing yeah. the eddy. Okay, gotcha. More or less. Are you going to find schools in there? Once you find one, you'll find several or most likely? Sometimes. Sometimes. 
there's a couple mm-hmm. pictures on my Facebook page of some schools that I've mm-hmm. put on Facebook page that people don't believe me, but that's proof. Mm-hmm. But I got a couple holes right around there that it's more death than what it shows on the mapping. Like the right. mapping doesn't show true because mm-hmm. it's tidal water. Right, right. So you're yeah, always going to have sand moving in, sand moving out. First time I was down there by myself, that deep hole, that deep mark right there to your right, the spools section, I was going up through there about 40 miles per hour and I hit a sand barge. Wow. It wasn't on my mapping. Yeah. Uh, Jacone has talked about this stretch and how uh-huh. much it has changed uh, before they built the bridge and then after, you know, and just how much, to your point, how much it can change um, over time, silt in or like you A said, lot. with tide and different things, construction, whatever. Um really change that you know back to the when you were talking about morning trips though you do night trips as well does that do yes. you indi- do you uh does is that up to the customer or you or you find there's that's a great question the customer know, the customer mm-hmm. will determine that so because and that's what i got to thinking too i didn't know if like we we just catfished at night because they do tend to feed more at night or yeah, like, not true you know, not true. really okay at least not down there it's not yeah nope. interesting okay why like i guess because the water is so deep dark down there anyway maybe. so it's light it's a light thing. They don't like the light necessarily. Is that? Is no, that... I, I don't. I don't know. Because like, it's a good like, question actually. Because let me rephrase it. I was always taught you always catfish at night. Yeah. And, and so was I. Might be a yeah. misconception. And so was I. Why? Why? What is that? Is it because they just eat more at night? Is I that think it? it's because it's channel cats, and uh, we all was raised up around channel cats, right? Not blue cats. Blue cats. Okay. That makes sense. The same way with flatheads. Okay. I say back when I was a kid. I'm 54. I'd say back when I was a kid, we always thought we was caught catching mud cats. Mm. Now that me and my cousin look back on it, they was probably flatheads. Just we was always told they was mud cats. Oh. Interesting. Because they're both ugly. And I think it was just probably, <laughs> I think you're right, because I think it's like deer hunting too. I mean, most guys will hunt early morning and late in the evening, but I've seen some big shots of my biggest bucks at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Like, you know what I mean? Midday sometimes can be. So it is interesting how we, mm-hmm. we as humans kind of, you know, get our mind around things and, or maybe just cause you got off work and it was something to do at night. I don't, Damn, I don't know, but it's interesting, but you are right. Yeah. We catch a ton of catfish during the day. So it's not like, and you're hundred percent, it's not like they're not eating during the day. What are the top two times if somebody wanted to go out with you or just wanted to go out bank fishing? Like what are the top two times day or night to go? Down there, anytime up here, channel fishing, early morning, late day into the night. Into the night, so not like at two a.m. It, it it really yeah, has yeah. A, a up pa- to like midnight, up until midnight. Okay, my interesting. theory. Interesting. That's fascinating mm, to me. That, cool. that really is. Now, I'd be remiss since we have you here. Let's just say I'm gonna pull up a random lake uh, if I can find one because I want to know if there's a difference between tide, lake, and river. Basically, just for g- generic catfishing because I I do know um. <clears throat> Uh, I think we discussed this. You've also fished up at like dam, dam four and five. Mm-hmm. Would that be more like a lake or a river? That's a river. That's more of like a river vibe. Okay. Yeah. So then let's go with, well, we could just talk about that. Well, let's go right here on the Potomac. Fine. Let's go up here. This is basically a river. All right. This is up near Ashburn. So let's just say you, you got basically a river here. Someone wants to go out. What are you looking for map wise to catfish? If you could get there. Perfect situ- situation. If I know it's deep enough. I mean, if you have a smaller boat, jet boat, you can go in shallow water and find deeper holes and de- debris. debris. That would be my go-to spot. So you want stuff on the bottom, yeah. basically there. Okay. Yep. So it's not just the deepest hole. You want something there. Correct. Rocks, ledges, little dips in the gr- in the bottom. How long? And I think this is a key. I think this is a big question. How long do you want to give it? Because I've always been like, do you sit there and I, I think it's because I always bank fish as a kid with my with with my aunt, and so we didn't have anywhere to go, so we stay there all night. But since you have a boat, how long do you give a hole before you move? I'll stay at my holes sometimes, the full six hours of a tide. Wow. Okay. Wow. Because they'll come around, they'll hit a good half hour, forty five minutes of constantly, take a 15, 20 minute break, the fish wheel, then they'll come right back. Interesting. And when you say come back, because I'm also thinking they probably cruise too. I've yeah, seen them cruising like I almost... say I call it making laps. Right there, you go. Gosh, we heard that with smallmouth with, uh, yeah. with Jeff, Little. Jeff Little. Yeah, that's making. That's laps. what I say. I've always thought they just sit on the bottom and do nothing. <laughs> no, nope. and, and that they're. And it's almost like they're certain. Like you talked about earlier, hunters, which is a good way of looking at it too. 
It's almost like they're searching, and I got to think because you talk about stripe or whatever chasing bait, mm -hmm. and I think again, if you're eating, you have to. And you're opportunistic, but if there's nothing here, let's go try to find something. Find to somewhere eat. else. Let's go find the golden grail. That's so. I mean, that's so fascinating. To me. I have stayed at my. Perhaps. I've stayed at the bridge, the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, for 12, 14 hours straight, and caught over sixty fish. Wow! Wow! Of all sizes. Interesting. And is that the same thing that you would suggest for just a regular river that's not tidal? Same thing, just find a spot and stay there the whole time? Or do you give yourself a handicap on a river? If I fish a tournament, I give them a half hour, 45 minutes. If I'm catching small fish, a lot of small fish, I'll leave it for tournament fishing. Okay. But if I have clients like that want eaters, and if we're catching 10, 12, 15 pounders, I'll stay there. Mm -hmm. They're happy. They're catching fish. And if they get a bigger one, it's a bonus. That's a good point. I've had guys that came down and just want to target big fish. I have guys that come. Most people would rather catch a lot of fish than one or two big fish. Because mm. hmm. even, the, believe it or not, 30, 40, 50 foot deep holes, a 20 pound catfish is pretty feisty. Absolutely. Especially when you're not used to catching something that big. Yeah. I mean, that's to your point, yes. If the average person, we're going to be like, heck yeah. Yeah. I, I had mean, a guy a couple of weeks ago, a muscle-bound person, pretty muscular, and his fish was, I forget exactly what it was, 30 couple pounds, and it wore him out. Huh, huh. And he was a weightlifter. Uh, and the time he got done, his arms felt like rubber. Wow. And it is because, like, I think Dad always talks about, you know, bluegill, and I'm the same way. You get you catch a bluegill. I mean, not that you get – super excited about that but you're still you know it's it's that tug and fight all right and so and then and then here will be our, our last one so guys so for tidal river we talked about that for a regular river we talked about that this is burke lake in northern virginia this is the fastest one i could find so just kind of like to show cat daddy basically what we got here so in a lake water's not really moving what are we what are we looking at here ledges debris And deeper holes. So, where on this map would you like? So, looking at it, so you're just looking for these contour lines. You're looking for the deepest hole possible, almost. So, like right in this area hmm. here is where you're looking. Yeah. Deepest hole. And but it, to the left or to the right, if there would be debris, then I would might be able to stay there. Okay. Or stay where the debris is and throw some over in the deep hole. That gotcha. way, you have both. Mm -hmm. That's so weird that they want the deepest water. Now, not, is, not always true. Really? I've called him a shallow as three foot deep. Really? What brought that? Was that just random or was it like some circ circumstances? There's another hole I have down there that's about 20 foot deep. It's about three foot deep around it. So you got to be on plane to get to it. Hmm. So once you get to it, you can, the hole is only big enough for about three or four rides. So then I'll just throw one or two out on the side. Oh. Just cover your base. Yeah. yeah. Do they prefer, does the depth have to do with the time of day too? Does that affect it at all? Like at night, do they position differently than during the day or in the morning? I don't fish a lot of lakes, but to my knowledge, no. Not not blue cats. Okay. Channels are a little bit different and flatheads are definitely different. How, how are, I mean, since we have you here, like what, what is the difference between like channels and flats? Flats will go farther away to get bait because so they like live stuff, you know. They'll, they'll move farther for that live that live bait. Channels prefer like chicken liver, shrimp. To my eyes, a channel is a trash fish. I mean, even though catfish are in general, but they just don't get big like a blue cat or, or a flathead. So of all the species, the one that's the most predatory is the flathead. Yes. And then the one that is the classic you, chicken liver and shrimp would be the channel. Channels. Which is probably where I was brought up fishing. Yeah, that's what I was too. That's yep. where my thought process. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Okay. And and so would you, what's the easiest one to, to learn how to fish? Tidal, river, or lake? And what's the hardest? The hardest I would say would be lakes. Lakes, you do a lot of trolling. You troll for catfish? Well, about a half mile per hour to a mile, you can like drift fish. How? Really? We call it drift fishing. Same setups and everything? Yep. Really? Yep. I didn't know Which that. you got to think. I mean, again, I, just, it, I never thought about it, but if they're going to smoke, like you said, a chatterbait or spinnerbait gonna... or the lipless, you know, that you're running through there and mm -hmm. they smack it, you know, it does make sense. A lot of the lakes, like um, Lake Kerr, all of them down there, mm. 
everybody catfish is down there will use um, drift fish, socks to drift mm -hmm. or wow. trolling motors. Interesting. So then let's just say, so if, if, if you did that here, um, you would start either at the, the mouth of this creek, this cove, or mm -hmm. at, and then just drift in from, so from the mouth all the way back would be like a drift setup. Yeah. Drift like from the back to out to the deep hole. Okay. Go shallow to deep. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. That's fascinating. I never thought about that before. So that's how those guys at Kerr do it. Basically yes. With all that. Interesting. Lake Kerr. Um, what's the one right below that? Gaston. 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 Yep. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Hmm. That's, that's pretty much what all of them do. Huh. Is drift about a half mile per hour. I didn't know that. I did not know that. That is fascinating. Potomac River is a little bit hard to drift because the current's so strong, but you can do it. But the current probably also helps you because it positions the fish in like specific areas, mm -hmm. right? Or sometimes the sometimes. current gets pretty strong on there. I had my trolling motor last weekend, I had it set on eight miles per hour, and I was barely moving. Wow. That's great. I just, wow. Learn yeah. something every time. Mm -hmm. That's how strong the Potomac is. Especially with all this rain that we're getting up here now, it'll make the current down there stronger. Mm. Now, it won't flood because it's so big and wide, but the current will get strong. That's that's insane. So one thing is, like, anglers, make sure you, you bring the heaviest, you know, weights you possibly can, leads, up to eight ounces or more. That's really important. Mm -hmm. um, and did we actually go into your tackle box yet? I don't think we no. had an opportunity. Yeah, let's, let's hit that then. <clears throat> As he's opening up there, I, I can't help but remember summertime. I was younger, newly married. We're in a town home and uh, did the old chicken liver deal. You know, got two packs. Um, it was smelling outside. We had a little little stoop and little area there and closet area, and and this stench in this neighborhood was just awful. I remember thinking, so I pulled everything out, smelling my river shoes, everything. Can't find it. Put everything back. Another week goes by. I'm talking middle of the summer, and I get in some new fishing lures, and I go to open my tackle box, and there's those chicken livers. Mm. I mean, I'm talking two weeks in the summertime, <sighs> and yes, but here and stupid me, like I mean, to this day I laugh that I even did this, but it's like I know that's the source, right? And and but I've got to look at it, so I open it up, and then mm. I mean, it about knocked me down. It was so funny, but and I never did get the smell out of my tackle box. But anyway, so yeah, don't leave the chicken livers. Don't leave the, the chicken livers in your, in tackle, your tackle box. box. Don't forget to take or them don't out. leave your bait in your gill net. Oh, that would be bad too. I've done that too. Yes, yeah, oh. so you got to take the time. You got it, and that's the other thing about guide service too. As he gets into this, just the clean. You having to clean up afterwards, mm -hmm. and your your tackle, your all that stuff. But I clean my boat every trip. Clean wow. my rods and reels every trip. That's smart. That's smart. And then, so what is in your goodie bag? Well, this is just the way I have it organized a little bit. This is my, I use different beads. I have some hard beads and some soft beads. That hmm. like an arts and crafts thing. That's really yeah. Cool. The beads are soft. I put that up against my knot because eventually it'll slide over my knot and protect it more. Oh. And then my hard wow. beads are on top. That'd be cool for a Carolina rig, actually. Yeah. That's all I use. Carolina hmm. rigs. And my swivels, 220 pound swivel. Oh, 220 pound. My slide sinkers, my slides, and then you just put your, I guess one's a 12 ounce. Oh, wow. And it'll slot down your line. Hmm. That's brilliant. Drag on the bottom. And this would also be good, guys. I think if you're also a saltwater fisherman, this same setup would work for a lot of situations, yeah. too. And occasionally I'll do a drop with a three-way, but I don't use them too often. Why? It seems like the the sinker will wrap around the line more mm -hmm. and get twisted up. Hmm. So anytime you have a line cross the line, you got it'll break easier. A line would take you can take 20, 30, 40 pound line, and if you tie it a regular knot, you can pull it and break it. Interesting. Where if you make a good knot, it won't just break on strength. What type do you type a do you tie a snell knot for your circle hook? I do not. What is it that you tie? Um, I think it's called the uni knot. The uni knot? Okay. I think that's what they call it. But I just got it when I was a kid on the back of a Eagle Claw package. Mm. And I it just stuck with about. me. Some people say if you tie a snail on the circle hooks, it makes the hook work, work better. I've tried it. In my eyes, it works just the same. Just the same? Wow. Then underneath here, then, I just picked this up.
Then I just keep my extra bobbers and some sinkers and stuff down in here. And the coin sinkers that slide the same way. And my pliers. Not officially a tackle box, but it works great for what I use it for. Mm -hmm. Gotta love Home Depot. Oh, yeah. 34 bucks. If you're not fishing the tidal and you're fishing up on the Shenandoah River or the Upper Potomac, do you still need 12 ounces of weight? Or what size weight would you go with if you're up here? I normally use six. Six ounces? Up here. Wow. That's still pretty heavier than I thought. I'll use months. the same setup. Okay. Just reduce my weight size. The one thing I also want to talk about that we had you was the tournament fishing. Because I, I how does a catfish tournament work? Like, is that, do you catch one? Do you just catch weigh release do you bring it back for a weigh-in like how does that whole thing it depends on who you're fishing with and for um they're either one or two or or five if you're fishing like a channel cat tournament you catch five you keep your five biggest in a live well say for deadline if you fish from seven to three three o'clock's weigh in you come back you take all five fish you weigh them in and then you weigh in your biggest one hmm. and then they have to swim away to be oh, able to count. Hmm. If they swim if they don't swim away, you get disqualified. I didn't know that. So all the tournaments I've fished in, all of them have to swim away to be acceptable. So you said there's a channel cat tournament. Is there like mm -hmm. a blue cat and a flathead tournament? Yes. Uh you go up Susquehanna up there, they have a lot of the flathead tournaments up there where you catch most of them I think is two. So you keep your two biggest flatheads and you take them back to weigh in and weigh them out. They doing the same thing, releasing them. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Like you said, I can understand if that's the species you like. It's like a smallmouth guy. You're not. We're putting them back in because yeah. we want to catch them later. Yeah. Um, your blue cats normally on the Potomac they do a two fish weigh in, and sometimes it takes a big live well to keep. If you catch two fifty pounders, it takes quite a bit of water to keep oh, them okay. alive. That, and that's a big live well. Yeah. Mm. And then what a lot of people don't know about is releasing the air in their stomach. If you pull a fish up too fast off of 60, 70 foot deep of water, they get air in their belly. Mm -hmm. and then whenever you release them, they'll float mm -hmm. and they'll die. Hmm. So I recommend carrying like a half inch piece of PVC and just stick it down their throat. Really? And then you'll hear them burp. Is that and that right? air will get out of their belly and then they'll be fine. Now, if you take your time to get a fish up... Mm -hmm. It'll have time to release this air. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of a catfish. People say they're talking to you or barking at you, where they're releasing that air out of their stomach. Mm. Then that's fine. I they'll, didn't know they'll that. Swim away. Huh? That's why they talk. <laughs> I, I just wow. I didn't. Okay, I just learned something else. God, I love yep. doing this. Um, wow, that is so freaking cool. So, do you ever <clears throat> the tournaments up where we live? Mm -hmm. Um. Not getting too much I mean, the detail of that. Like, are those any catfish counts? Or are they specifically flathead? They're both. They're both? Yeah. Like you... the one coming up April 29th is channel cat. Okay. So you keep your five biggest channel cat. Okay. And then if it's a multi one, do you weigh them all separately or do, do, does all the weight count? It depends on the tournament. Okay. <clears throat> Some of them, if you go to like damn, like damn five big slack water, they'll do both. They'll do a flathead and a channel both. So they'll combine all the weight together. And that'd be like a five fish yeah. limit? Okay. Interesting. Yep. I didn't. So they kind of like, they're just like bass guys then too. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Is there any kind of like nuance about that? Is like how many rods you're allowed to use? They get into that stuff or? Every state is different. So you just um, follow state regulations yes. then? Yes. Yep. I didn't know that. Yep. Wow. That's so fascinating. Until you go to DC water, then you better really read their book. Because their laws are different than anybody else's. And theirs are broken up by, like you're saying, even Woodrow Wilson Bridge, like above, below, like they're they're kind. There's lines. Yes, Woodrow Wilson Bridge. There's a little bit of an angle that goes from the Virginia side to the Maryland side. Mm -hmm. There's an angle there to Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Mm -hmm. That past that is DC waters. Right. Clear right. up above Chain Bridge, hmm. and then you're back into Maryland waters. Then gotcha. But you are required to have a DC fishing license. Really? Yes. Even like I'm a charter. I have my charter license. They don't recognize charter captains up there. Interesting. So even I'm required to have a DC fishing license. No other state I'm I have to have them, but I have two in DC. 
interesting. And there's no reciprocal. Like if Virginia, Maryland would have, you know, reciprocal agreements mm-hmm. on to fish either side, as long as you're on the river. But I guess they don't have that. Not in D.C. Not in D.C. You can be in the Virginia bank, but mm-hmm. you're D.C. waters. Interesting. And D.C. has their own laws and regulations, like no gill nets. You can't have them even in your boat. Hmm. Landing net size, they have a requirement on the landing nets being too big. You can't have your cast nets in your boats. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah they're interesting. They're, they're strict up there. And that does make it tough. I mean, that makes it hard because you're so close to yeah. the different states. And the, yeah, but D.C. is not a state. you got to know it. Yeah, but even like Virginia, Maryland, even though Maryland, I think, owns the water, and then now D.C., you know, and those lines and then different, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a lot to know. Oh, yeah. And to keep up with. And it, it may change year to year. It changes quite often. Mm-hmm. If you're a bank guy, and I know the comment sections are, are going to be asking this question, I only fish from a bank. Where's a place I can go to have success on the tidal Potomac? Um, where are a couple of places that people could go that actually could just catch something? Haynes Point up in D.C., but there again, they're required to have a $13 fishing license. I didn't know that. Okay, interesting. Haynes um, Point. If they look up Fort Washington, there's a nice place there, a nice bank where they can fish at, all deep water. Hmm. Always fish in there. Uh, if you go on down a little farther south of Woodrow of the uh, Fort Washington, there's a a public pier there where they can fish at. That's Maryland. Making sure I'm guessing your creeks too. What I've noticed, we went out of Occoquan and different things. You got sometimes your creeks are good areas too, and. When you're talking earlier about the bank fishermen, your peers a lot of times will will have a lot of guys, gals, you know, with lines out on, mm-hmm. on that helps. Peers. All right, so now we're looking at this. Here's Fort Washington. Here's the bluff. So you're talking about right in this area. Yeah. So there's like a lighthouse and stuff right on the corner. Yeah. Anywhere through there, you can go into that park. Take a tour of the park while you're there. Of the old fort, and there then go down the bottom and, and fish. Hmm. And that makes sense because you guys can see, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, you have the channel that swings in tight. So, not a big leap to say. Basically, pull out the Navionics map. Guys, it's a web app. You can get it. It's free. And you're basically looking wherever the main channel swing is closest to, you know, bank fishing opportunities is pretty much generically what you're looking for, right, is deep water access. So, fort. Uh, Fort National Park right there. Again, link in the episode description for this. That's interesting. And then I guess up here, DC, you said? Straight up. Keep going farther. Keep going. Right there on that point. Right here? Up farther. Oh. On the actual point. Right there. That's called Haynes Point. Oh, you can fish this? You can fish all that through there. Hmm. I didn't know that. Now, it's not all that deep, but there is fish all through there. Definitely got three different channels coming in. The right, that's the Anacosta. Right here? I've clear to the right, yeah. The Worcester Channel that takes you up to Georgetown. There are some places up there fish that I won't tell you where. But this is legal. I thought you get like shot if you go up into the here and fish. Like I didn't. <laughs> that's why. Just, I, that's why I carry a gun so I can shoot back. That makes sense. Because <laughs> again, like guys, like again, I know I'm, I'm I'm more of a country guy, but like still, like DC, you don't think fishing. You yeah, think no, I'm ignorant. Gan violence and like, politics. Yeah. yeah, no, it's you can go the whole way up through there. Now it's all a no wake zone, but you can fish the whole way up through there. Now it's a dead end, but yeah. You have your crew. I know a lot of times you have your crew teams out too, rowing and stuff. It's and, bad up there, summertime. Yeah. I mean, they can get, I mean, I don't speak from experience. I've never fished it, but just being, driving across the bridge and stuff and seeing. You, you go up into D.C., it's really, really bad. Mm-hmm. And one of the main, we're getting back to night fishing is one of the reasons why we do night fishing is it's not as hot, mm-hmm. less boat traffic. Right. Is, a main, is the main mm-hmm. thing. What's the best time of year to go out there and catch the biggest possible? Right now. Right now in the spring? Early spring, pre-spawn, winter time. May, June, July is normally is when they're spawning. Really? When the water temperature gets about 70 degrees. I didn't know that. Okay. But it, it varies because the weather is so, so screwed up right now. Mm-hmm. Wow. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Like I've had some days in May and June, I've we've caught almost 60 fish. Wow. That's 
that. That's awesome. Of course, I guess it's also important if there's, I don't know how many people out there like, oh, after watching this, you know, I'm going to go out. Um, that Potomac again, because to your point is tidal. I saw some different wrecks on these maps mm -hmm. looking at your, your depths and just your channels. It's not something to just jump in a boat and go like you have to have some experience knowledge. knowledge you've got some big yachts on these waters also so and they're going to throw a tremendous wake so yes not recommend you go out your john boat or you know your little tracker and think that you're going to go out and catch some cats because bad things will happen so don't uh but to your point the bank fishing is a good place to start um you, there's definitely a bigger learning curve to navigate these these types of waters and having the right boat and having the right boat and right equipment and gear and all that good stuff and that also makes just it's again this is why i love having these conversations and reaching across it like this is mm -hmm. now i know why you get the boats the way you do a catfish right. boat is right. it's not only because you need the rod spread but you're in the middle of the worst part of the river right. or the lake whereas mm -hmm. bass guys we're always dipping out of the current and stuff right you need a high side center console mm -hmm. boat to yep. deal with mm -hmm. this stuff I mean, that's just right. like, it all makes sense. And why why DC is such a big area for catfishing. And I know there's tons of TikTokers and people like that that do bank fishing stuff. And now I know why. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you're narrowing down those channels. It's something that you can fish. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, if you look like Matta Woman and Belmont Bay, look how wide this river is. There's no way mm -hmm. you can be as consistent with just the fish concentration mm -hmm. as you can up near DC. A lot of water. Boom. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of water. It makes so much sense now. And there is honestly a shitload of bass down there hmm. a shitload of that's bass. a that's a good segue into as a cat guy i hear about the complaining from the bass side all the time what are your what do you think is a pain in the butt that you deal with from your side looking at the bass side what's frustrating bass fishermen's really other than crying that our catfish are eating their bass they really don't bother you the commercial fishermen is what's killing everything. Interesting. Even the bass. I've caught a five pound, 13 ounce largemouth last year on a piece of cut bait bigger than my hand. Well, hmm. I didn't do it. One of my clients did. That bass died because it took a piece of cut bait. The hook never touches the mouth. And I did whatever I could to get that chunk out of his mouth to let him survive. He just had it too far deep. So just the commercial people are catching them on their on their trout lines. Because they're again, if the bass is going to eat cut bait on my fishing hook, they're going to eat that cut bait on their trout lines. Mm -hmm. And I know from experience there's a lot of bass down there. Two years ago, it was November. The shed wasn't where they always was, was at. So I put them, and I'll tell you, right there, you see the restriction area? Uh, the, the submarine base, yeah. Yeah. You go on back in there a little farther, there's an old nuclear plant right right there. Really? I set my gill net right through there. And between setting my gill net twice, I caught over 100 bass. And all of them was released alive. Because I respect bass. Well, I mean, you were talking about the cut bait too, and it is true. Like we had a big smallmouth up Lake Holiday that was found floating and get to it and realize it it choked a you know big old bluegill. Mm -hmm. So same thing, got hungry. Its eyes were bigger than its you know mouth or stomach. So it's and not to say, I mean that. And again, I guess in reality, it is a dog eat dog world. We talk about this all the time. Now the good thing about this is you got a lot of water, a lot of depth. As compared to a smaller, you know, Susquehanna or, or Shenandoah, which is just more concentrated. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's you bring up some some valid points. When you clean catfish, have you ever found bass in their bellies? Never, never found a bass. Never have found a crab, as the striper people say. Do striper complain about the? Do striper fishermen complain about the blue cats? Oh yeah, they hate them with a passion. Really? Why? They've actually made videos of them killing the blue the blue fish. And thrown them overboard. The blue know, cats or blue fish? Blue cats. Blue cats, okay. Yeah. I know people will actually fish for blue cats and just take them home and throw them in the garden for fertilizer because they're bass fishermen and they say they're killing the bass. Interesting. Hmm. It is interesting. I've, I've cleaned thousands of blue catfish and honestly have never caught one that had a bass in it 
a crab in it. Now I catch them clams because there's a lot of little clam beds down there. Snails. Nutty beside I well we just tore a gut open last week. I went to I had two boys on the boat or three boys and I showed them they want to know what to eat. I actually cut it open and showed them. It had a shad head about four inches long and another piece the size of my hand in its belly. There was no other fish in there. No crayfish in there. Just shad. Hmm. I've heard rumors, and this is other doc talk that I really wanted to bring up to you, is about the Manhattan and the shad runs. And one issue that people feel like in the Chesapeake Bay Association and the title James and the title Potomac is that the Blue Cats potentially, or maybe right now, are having an effect on the Manhattan and the shad run and that they're decimating it because they're such voracious predators. I mean, is there any validity to that argument at all? In my opinion, no, because... The stripers are more aggressive than the blue cats. You can catch like a blue cat 90% of the time won't take nothing that's alive. Where stripers love live spot. You throw a live spot out there, they're going to go right after it. Or if you throw a live spot out for a blue cat, they won't fool with it. Now, if you kill that spot, then throw it out, they'll go after it. But I, I believe a lot of it is they're not patrolling the commercial side of it enough. Interesting, especially on the Chesapeake Bay. That's an, you know you do bring up, and I don't have enough to, I don't have enough knowledge to, to weigh in, but it is interesting to hear when I mean, you listen to this conversation. Almost very similar to when we talked um, to the gentleman from the James the other day about like the farmers, the the uh, you know the pointing a finger on a farmer saying, well, he's the reason they're the reason you know the we have the pollution or the problems that we have, and is that justified? Is that correct? Is it correct? And uh, you're you're you might be onto something, you know, with that too. That you're almost pointing the fingers at the wrong, wrong people. Um, and I think the different bodies. And I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. To be honest with, you. like personally, like I'm I'm staying neutral. I, I don't know because I know how Mother Nature is too. And it's she has a way of regulating herself. Um, and then there is a coexisting, and it's a dog eat dog world. And we're in a, it's an environment where the strong survive, you know, and mm-hmm. the weak die. And it's. And it's, it's, I don't know. I, like I say, I truly don't know um, how I feel or what I think about it because we don't know. I'm going to say too, I'm going to challenge. We just like you talked about a, a hundred bass in that small area. We roll up here on the bass boats and you may catch a couple. You may catch two or three of those hundred. You might catch five and put in your live well, but you also might not catch anything. You're going to say, oh, it's a dead sea. But truth be told, they're down there, right? Yes. And you only know because you brought them up with a net. Um, so it's, it's interesting. I'm uh, intrigued by it. And this is something I would like to get someone on the show that can talk to this, this more. And I think Jeannie, I think you and I maybe talked about this briefly yesterday and I guess it was absolutely crazy, but, um, the Mississippi watershed, mm. the new river, you flathead or native, the Mississippi watershed, you have blues channels, flathead, pike, musky, smallmouth, largemouth, shad, everything. Hmm. No issues in those systems. Interesting. Why is it the James, the Chesapeake, and the, uh, the Potomac are having this issue with blues? What's missing? Mm-hmm. What's the difference? Or is it a perceived issue? That's my or question. Or is it a perceived too. I don't issue? Know. Like, it, it to me, it's just so politics. What do you mean? Government. They base everything on stripers. They feel the world revolves around striper fishing. And whatever the striper people say is what the government believes in. Hmm. Are you talking commercially or, or privately or like? Cause Both. I, okay. Because, I mean, that's off. I mean, I think we might have broke there for a minute, but you talked about why, too. Money. Money is going to drive yep. the industry and the decisions, especially on the legislative level, um, you know, in Congress um, or in D.C., like, you know, if, if the, the, the big money is going to dictate, determine what, what laws are passed, and what regulations are, are going to be put down and different things like that. Whereas the recreational guy or the small business guy like yourself, you know, is not going to have the same say um, at the table because he doesn't have the same money. And so it's, it is very interesting. Yeah. Cause it's also perception and, and people's perception of things. And I think that's so important. Um, I think a striper is more of a, a upper class type of fish mm-hmm. that has more of a history, you know, on the Chesapeake. Mm-hmm. And so that already has it there. Whereas if, you know, if you're a bass guy, some bass guy might think like, 
their only experience dealing with with cat fishermen are people in the Shenandoah that leave all their trash on the side of the bank right. and leave 500 feet of braided line broken down mm -hmm. wrapped in their trolling motor mm -hmm. and it's like well now this is my perception of cat fishermen mm -hmm. You know, not this guy that like I'm gonna defizz these big catfish. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put them back after a catchway release tournament, mm -hmm. and that fills out the picture a little mm -hmm. bit more of, of this whole, this, you know, this whole community mm -hmm. of cat fishermen. Um, because I mean, that's the one thing I, I'd like to talk to you about is like like that's the one thing I think that would help so much when you're trying to extend it of olive branches. One thing is like don't leave your braided line out on the water. Like, don't do that, please. Just clean up after yourself. Mm -hmm. I know when I go down to Williamsport and I walk my dog and I see so much crap on the shore, you're right, it may, might not be a cat fisherman that's doing that, but still, just pick up your shit, please. Like, come on. And you, But you talk about Striper, though. It, again, that one trip, and there's only one trip, but listening to him complain, same thing. So, like, it's not that the Striper even protected because he, he's – but he's a small business guy. Mm -hmm. and But his he had the same complaint about the commercial fishery. And you, you were know? talking about earlier <clears> – <throat> sorry, I want to make sure we finish that. They're supposed to use circle hooks, but you right. said they don't always use circle hooks. Could Correct. You, could you explain that a little bit more? Like, wh what do you mean that they don't use it? Do you have, like – first-hand knowledge of this or what well i watched a couple uh commercial guys pull up their 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 um trout lines and you can see like the one time i was close enough to it because it kind of went right in one of my favorite holes and so i i still fish it because i pay my my mm -hmm. fees and just like like he does um and he was pulling up close to me and you could see it plain as day where he had straight shaft hooks could you take a picture of this the next time it happens and send it to me? As in the actual hook? Yeah. just Or like, him pulling it up? Yeah, both. Either or. Just so I can like, because I want to make sure, like I want to get some guys on too so we can talk about it. So A lot of times if I'm fishing down or to the point now where I done gave all the commercial people so much hail, if, if I'm there fishing, they'll go to the next line. They won't come by, come by me. So, and I'll bring this out on social media too, guys, um, with the podcast. If, if you have any evidence of this as well, send me some pictures of it too. And if there's any kind of commercial fishermen organizations I need to talk to, email me. Let me know which ones because this will be on my to-do list right now. I'm working on the bow fishing scene. I'm trying to get guys on for that. But I do want to try to get some commercial fishermen on too to it, talk about it. And that's a good point too is I thought, you know, they're commercial fishermen. They're still in an industry too. And if we like to eat fish and seafood and things like that. But again, it's like, well, how do you regulate that? And then what... You know, your private farms, I know, you know, a lot of organizations out there are, are raising fish just for, um, you know, the store, grocery stores for purchase. And then, but how do you, or do you, mm -hmm. are you more offshore? Like, do you protect, you know, uh, a certain area? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. And it's, you know, probably wrong for me to weigh in because I don't know, but it's an interesting dialogue. But it's very much a, it mm -hmm. seems like a, I think we mentioned this before we, we recorded, it's a tidal river tidal river bay issue mm -hmm. because you're not going to have like you know what yeah i was i was fishing sturgeon creek in lake anna and like you know mm -hmm. there's these there's this commercial fishermen there it's like mm -hmm. you don't have this on the big lakes necessarily mm -hmm. could be wrong but at least lake anna and places mm -hmm. like that you don't mm -hmm. so this is definitely right. a, a tidal river issue a chesapeake point. bay yeah. issue that we should probably mm -hmm. you know start to highlight um yeah, Gene, I, again, like I know we're, we're, we're running up on it here, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate you coming out. Is yeah, there thanks any, for having me. Yeah. Is there anything else that we forgot to mention that you want to bring up or talk about that you think us, us non-catfish guys really need to know about or to be aware of? Just don't be afraid to ask help and ask questions because mm -hmm. you got to learn somehow. That's right. That's no. the way I started. No, that, that's a dialogue. Where absolutely. can people find you if they want to I'm on a trip? Um, Facebook, Cat Daddy Fishing Charters, and my website's in the working. Mm -hmm. They're just having some issues with it. Mm -hmm. And then, guys, link in the episode description to everything we talked about to be able to book a trip with Gene, Cat Daddy uh, Charters. Uh, also, if by the time this episode goes up, his website might be done, so a link will be in the episode description to his website as well, because I can always add the website in later, depending on when this drops. Um, what is your booking like right now? Are they able to book a trip with you right now? Or are you booked? Yeah, for next I'm booked. Year? Uh, my April's pretty full. I have a, a one or two days left in April, but after that, I have some openings every month. 
fantastic awesome that's fantastic gene thank you so much i really appreciate it and guys if you want to come on the show talk about your guide business or you want to talk about any kind of topic here your flathead i had pat on to talk about flathead on the upper potomac we had gene on to talk about the tidal river blue cat situation if you're a snakehead guy a bow fishing guy come on the show and and tell me your piece don't just say it in the comment section let's actually have a good dialogue about that again like and subscribe to the channel it really helps us out in the algorithm we are fishing the dmv we are the largest fishing and outdoor show in the greater dmv area we'll see you next time Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.